Jericho Network on Westwood One. Just before we get started with today's show, I want to fill you in on an upcoming episode of the Rock and Roll Twilight Zone. We're putting together a special Q&A episode. The episode will feature questions from you, questions that you feel have gone unanswered in previous episodes, or questions that we haven't even dealt with before on the show. Here's your opportunity to unload all of your burning questions. And if I can't answer it, we'll find the person who can. Record your questions, including your name and where you're from. Then email your audio to me at rrtz.questions at gmail.com. That's rrtz.questions at gmail.com. This special Q&A edition of the Rock and Roll Twilight Zone will drop later this summer. Courtney Love is almost certainly the forger. She was practicing someone's handwriting. Kurt Cobain did not die of a shotgun. This is the Rock and Roll Twilight Zone with Richard Serrett. Heard exclusively on the Jericho Network in partnership with Westwood One. Unearthing the biggest stories from the history of rock. Exposing the truth and the tragedy. The stories behind rock's immortals. The Rock and Roll Twilight Zone. What might happen is that we blow your mind. Here's your host, Richard Serrett. What do Elvis Presley, John Lennon, and Michael Jackson all have in common? It turns out they're all worth more dead than alive. And to this list, let's add one more. Recently, Kurt Cobain became the highest grossing dead artist in history. Could this sad but true fact provide a clue as to why he's no longer with us? Welcome to part one of a two-part series on the possible murder of Kurt Cobain. On the occasion of Nirvana's induction into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in 2014, REM's frontman Michael Stipe said this, Nirvana tapped into a voice. They were kicking against the mainstream. They spoke truth and a lot of people listened. They were singular and loud and melodic and deeply original, Stipe continued. And that voice, that voice, Kurt, we miss you. Kurt Donald Cobain was born in Aberdeen, Washington on February 20th, 1967. He formed the band Nirvana along with bassist Chris Novoselic and original drummer Aaron Burkhardt in 1987. They quickly became a huge part of the Seattle music scene, which later became known as grunge. Nirvana's debut album Bleach was released on the independent record label Sub Pop in 1989. But the group really took off after signing with DGC Records, owned by recording industry mogul David Geffen. Nirvana became an alt-rock mainstay with Smells Like Teen Spirit from their second album Nevermind, which cemented the group's reputation as the flagship band of Generation X. Cobain was hailed as the spokesman of a generation. However, he was uncomfortable with the label, believing his message and artistic vision had been misinterpreted by the public, with his personal problems often subject to media attention. During the last years of his life, we're told Cobain struggled with heroin addiction and chronic health problems such as depression. The oft-repeated narrative says Cobain had difficulty coping with his fame and public image and the professional and personal pressure surrounding himself and his wife, musician Courtney Love. On April 8, 1994, Cobain was found dead at his Seattle home by a security system installer. His death was ruled a suicide by a self-inflicted gunshot wound to the head. The circumstances surrounding his death has been the subject of a number of books and documentaries which question the official version of Cobain's supposed suicide. Several authors and documentary filmmakers have gone so far as to allege that Courtney Love was involved in her husband's murder 
The list of her accusers includes the private investigator and former Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department detective who was originally hired by Love to find her missing husband after he walked out of a rehab clinic in Los Angeles. It also includes Love's own attorney, Rosemary Carroll. Love has never been charged, nor has she been the subject of an investigation into Cobain's death. In fact, none of the allegations you are about to hear have been proven in a court of law. All of these allegations are out there swirling around in the public domain, and she has vehemently denied them all. You're about to meet a veteran Seattle-based journalist who visited the Cobain residence on the day his body was discovered and began immediately broadcasting a local cable access TV program dedicated to investigating Cobain's possible murder. You'll also meet the co-author of two books alleging Cobain was in fact murdered. And finally, we'll hear from a Canadian music correspondent and radio host who handled public relations for the likes of Sir Bob Geldof, Ringo Starr, Randy Bachman, Snoop Dogg, The Smashing Pumpkins, and Ray Charles. In this episode of the Rock and Roll Twilight Zone, we're reopening the Kurt Cobain file and re-examining the circumstances surrounding his death. Was it suicide? Or are Courtney Love's accusers right? It may just smell like murder. Welcome back to the Rock and Roll Twilight Zone. Here's Richard Serrett. Our story begins less than a month before Kurt Cobain is discovered dead in his Seattle, Washington home. March 18th, Courtney Love calls 911 and claims Kurt has locked himself in a room with a gun and is suicidal. When the police arrive, Love admits that she lied, that she didn't actually see Kurt with a gun, and that Kurt did not claim he was going to kill himself. Cobain informs the police that he was not suicidal and that he locked himself in the room to get away from Courtney as the two had been arguing. March 25th, Love stages a five-hour drug intervention in an attempt to convince Cobain to seek treatment. Among those present are several members of Nirvana, excluding David Grohl, who disagreed with the intervention. Nirvana's manager Danny Goldman, attorney Rosemary Carroll, and Cobain's friend Dylan Carlson. Cobain grudgingly agrees to check into rehab. March 30th, Kurt Cobain and Dylan Carlson purchase a shotgun. According to Carlson, Kurt wanted the gun for protection of his family and wanted Carlson to purchase it as Kurt's other guns had been confiscated by the police. Kurt chooses a Remington M11 Sportsman 20-gauge semi-automatic shotgun that was set for light load. A box of shotgun cartridges was also purchased. March 26th, Love leaves Seattle and flies to California. She books a room at the Peninsula Hotel in Beverly Hills and would remain there until Kurt's body was discovered on April 8th. March 31st, Cobain officially begins his treatment at the Exodus Rehab Center in Marina del Rey, California. The next day, Cobain leaves Exodus Rehab. Max Wallace is the co-author of Who Killed Kurt Cobain and Love and Death, The Murder of Kurt Cobain. Kurt disappears from an L.A. rehab facility. He checks himself into rehab and then he just disappears. He leaves the rehab. Nobody sees him leave. And at this point, Courtney Love enters the picture. She hires a private detective, Tom Grant, in L.A., to find her husband. Because he was just uh, at large for about a week there. And for a very wealthy, very famous person to be at large and unaccounted for in many ways, except for press reports that show him trying to, you know, bum money from someone or being on an airline flight with Duff McKagan of Guns N' Roses. So nobody really knows when Cobain died and nobody really has truthful stories about the days leading up to his death. There's even a whole Gus Van Zandt movie called Last Days. But Last Days, which is a fictional film based on Cobain's Last Days, it just repeats the official lies. Obviously, Gus Van Zandt, a Hollywood filmmaker, didn't make any special efforts to investigate on his own. That's Rich Lee, an independent investigative journalist in Seattle who was the first person to claim Cobain's death was a homicide. In the days before the internet and social media, word of Cobain's disappearance from rehab traveled slowly. 
but Cobain's inner circle were said to be fearing the worst. Their worst fears, as it turned out, were about to come true. Eric Elper is a Canadian music correspondent, radio host, and PR consultant. They found his body in a greenhouse in his home in Seattle, Washington on April the 8th. An electrical contractor had found him. The forensic medical response is that he died from a gunshot wound, which was initially the media was reporting that it was to his head, but then later described in various biographies that were published afterwards is that he actually put the gun in his mouth and and died instantly. When Kurt was found dead, Courtney had recently checked herself into rehab. When he went missing, she was in the Peninsula Hotel in Beverly Hills. So Grant believes that Courtney checked herself into the facility so that she would be in rehab when his body was found. There would be no questions asked. Well, he was found around 9 a.m. in the morning by a person named Gary Smith of some company called Vecca Electric, who was there to install security lighting and perhaps cameras uh, to safeguard against intruders. And, you know, from the very beginning, there are problems with the police reports in terms of what the police saw and why things show up in later reports that weren't there in the original reports, always a problem in police cases. Why is it that the, the officer who first observes the dead body gives a very different version than subsequent reports that emerge? For instance, his wallet was not on display showing off his uh, Washington State driver's license. That's something that came up in later detectives' reports, you know, which are possibly fictional. And, you know, the, the original officer reporting does not see drug paraphernalia, which obviously played a very big part in the scenario that was concocted by the police. There were no fingerprints found on the shotgun. Uh, there was a supposed suicide note found near the body. And that is what led the police and investigators to conclude that it's an open and shut case of suicide. They find a suicide note, they find this guy dead with a shotgun in his mouth, and they jump to the natural conclusion. According to Rich Lee, not only were there startling inconsistencies in the police reports having to do with the death scene, the actual time of death was never definitively determined. There is a very substantial discrepancy between official statements about when Cobain died and when he actually died. Nobody really knows, but according to the person who signed the death certificate, Dr. Hartshorn of the King County Medical Examiner, it could be 24 hours longer before or 24 hours longer after April 5th. In other words, Dr. Hartshorn is completely non-committal. The person who signed the death certificate, totally non-committal about whether they got the date of death correct or not. In other words, this is not like some law and order episode where, you know, they do a, a quick uh, electronic scan of the body and say, based on temperature, he's been dead about six hours. They had no idea. So the April 5th death date is incorrect uh, in as much as it may be on the death certificate, but lots of parts of the death certificate are incorrect. When did Kurt Cobain actually die? I have very little confidence in, in stating anything other than it was, you know, sometime prior to April 8th. The first piece of evidence that researchers who suspect homicide point to is the 20-gauge shotgun Cobain supposedly used to take his life. Would it have been possible for anyone to take a long rifle such as this, turn it around and place the barrel in one's mouth and still reach the trigger? Max Wallace. Yeah, this long barreled shotgun that he would have had to hold in a very awkward fashion, stick it in his mouth and pull the trigger, considering the amount of uh, heroin that was in his body at the time and the, uh, the maneuvering that would have taken place to shoot himself that way. It just doesn't make sense. How is that even possible? Because it was such a large gun, it wasn't a handgun. Kurt Cobain was not the biggest, tallest, strongest person around. And so it would have been really difficult for him to have done that anyway. 
But add to that, with his state of mind and with the drug that was in his system, you tend to let the body go a little bit, whether you're high or whether you're drunk, that you may not have all of your strength as much as you would think that you do because you're kind of a little bit floating or sluggish. And that's one of the theories out there is that there is just no way that he could have actually done this himself. I had seen the twin of the gun at the gun shop in the weeks after Cobain's death, and it had, I believe, a 28-inch barrel, which would have been very easy to turn on oneself, but there's a, a, I believe it's called a flash suppressor or a choke bore at the end, which adds another six inches, which does bring about certainly that issue as to whether it would have been possible to turn the gun on himself. Although, to me, like so many of the issues that you know, appear in treatments of the Cobain case, it's kind of a non-issue because Kurt Cobain did not die of a shotgun. When the rock and roll Twilight Zone continues, do the levels of heroin found in Cobain's system rule out the possibility of death by shotgun blast? It's part o'clock. And all the little rock and roll Twilight Zoners are eagerly preparing for the next segment. Yes, everyone's chomping at the bit for Pappy Richard to bestow upon them some outlandish finding that may or may not give us an uneasy feeling. Hmm. Oh, look, everyone. It's Glenda the Ladyfish, Billy the Centipede, and Cappy the Boiler Pig. They're eating BLTs and drinking lemonade. What great fun. Welcome back to the rock and roll Twilight Zone. Here's Richard Serrett. You're listening to part one of a two-part series on the possible murder of Nirvana frontman Kurt Cobain. If Cobain had indeed placed the business end of a 20-gauge Remington shotgun in his mouth and fired, one would reasonably assume there would be a significant head wound or exit wound from the blast and copious amounts of blood at the scene. But there was no serious damage to Cobain's skull, no exit wound, and very little blood. But Max Wallace says he consulted forensic experts on these points and concluded they're not significant. A lot of people cite the blood evidence or the lack of blood at the scene, but we pursued that lead and forensic pathologists told us it's not that unusual. And we really do not know just how much blood there was because we've seen some of the photos uh, have emerged in recent years of the scene, but we don't have a complete picture. So it's really hard to say how much blood there was or wasn't, but but the lack of blood itself doesn't uh, necessarily prove anything one way or the other. So we didn't really... uh, cite that as as one of the factors. But Rich Lee claims to have seen video of the death scene and concludes the lack of blood and lack of damage to Cobain's skull cannot be disputed nor ignored. Well, for a lot of people, that's the most startling thing of all. But, you know, when I was up a a couple of months ago in front of uh, the Court of Appeals here in Washington, (laughs) I cut to the chase. I said, look, I discovered video in 1994 that showed the top of Cobain's head intact and no blood, not one drop of blood around the top of his head on the floor where the body was found. And that is an impossibility in a case of shotgun suicide, intraoral you know, explosion inside one's mouth also explodes the back of one's head. And believe me, just about every drop of blood in your body gets uh, exploded out the back of your neck and skull. That didn't happen in this case. According to media reports, the results of Cobain's autopsy and toxicology report revealed that he had 1.52 milligrams of morphine per liter of blood in his system. It's important to note that heroin metabolizes in the bloodstream as morphine. This would require a minimum injection of 225 milligrams of heroin, or roughly three times the lethal dose, even for a hardcore heroin addict. The dosage was so strong, according to a forensic pathologist that have examined the case and examined the autopsy results, they say that it would have been completely impossible for somebody to have taken that level of heroin and then neatly put away the heroin kit, picked up a shotgun, stuck in his mouth and pulled the trigger. He would have been unconscious within seconds of taking this kind of dose. 
so it just doesn't add up. Even FBI investigators have told us that this is very suspicious. Yet if you look at other possible scenarios, it would have been very easy for somebody to have shot up with him and given him a, an overly pure dose of heroin. And then once he was unconscious, uh, position the shotgun to make it look like a suicide. Law enforcement experts tell us this happens all the time. It's very easy to kill a junkie because you can do it this way and make it look like a suicide or an accidental overdose. When somebody like Kurt has been doing heroin and just that sheer amount of drugs for that long, you don't know whether or not if his body is not reacting the same as if it's a somebody else that might have taken those drugs for a day or a week or a month or even a year. Your body tends to kind of build up some sort of immune system to things like that. On paper, sure, you know, with that sheer amount, you would think it would kill anybody. But again, it's somebody else, I think, putting the emphasis on what they would think it would actually might be. You know, there have been studies that have come out that say that heroin addicts develop a tolerance. And many heroin addicts told us the same thing, that uh, what would, you know, kill one person would be easily tolerated by somebody who's completely dependent on heroin and has been taking it for years. And that's actually true. There's no question that tolerance levels vary and you can build up a very high tolerance. But forensic pathologists who have studied this case and the level of heroin that Kurt had in his body could not find a single case, not one single case in recorded history where somebody with the kind of levels that Kurt had would be able to shoot up and then function normally enough to you know, put away the heroin kit, pick up the shotgun. They say he would have been unconscious with the needle still stuck in his arm. Not dead, not dead yet, but unconscious. And when people talk about uh, studies showing two or three times the tolerance level, they're not talking about the kind of level that was found in Kurt's blood. They're talking about the kind of level for a fairly severe heroin addict. But the forensic pathologists that we consulted that specifically studied this case said that Kurt had triple the lethal dose that even the most severe heroin addict could tolerate in his body. Most experts say that that kind of dose would have just left him unconscious within a millisecond. If Cobain injected himself with a deliberate heroin overdose, why would he also shoot himself in the head with a shotgun, leaving his baby daughter the love of his life with horrific visual images to remember him by? Why not just simply go to sleep on the overdose and never wake up? But according to Rich Lee, this whole debate as to heroin levels found in Cobain's system is moot because the official toxicology reports were never released to the media or the public. Well, the, the chief medical examiner in 1994 um, was uh, Dr. Donald T. Ray, and I had a conversation with Dr. Ray in uh, May or June of 1994, shortly after Cobain died, and I discussed that point with him, and he said, we never released any information along those lines ever. I believe that came from his widow. So the Nick Broomfield film called Kurt and Courtney, which is a pretty famous documentary, really, they focus on this as some critical thing that must be examined in order to be responsible in the case. In fact, that's not an official fact. Therefore, all of this discussion for the last 24 years about the level of opiates in Cobain's system is kind of a moot point until, by the way, when the 20th anniversary rolled around and then Detective Szynski of the Seattle Police Department did make some passing non-scientific evaluation that mentioned the level of opiate in, in the bloodstream. But it appears that the official investigators are really just playing off what's been in the press. They never released that. Dr. Ray told me that directly. Dr. Ray told me it was his wife, Courtney Love, who released that. When the Rock and Roll Twilight Zone continues, we direct our attention to the suicide note. Welcome back. I think this show is going pretty good. Although, why must Richard always talk about death? He's clearly obsessed with the darker side of rock and roll. The McCoy. 
unfortunate events that happen. But then again, that's what this show is about. Welcome back to the Rock and Roll Twilight Zone. Here's Richard Serrett. You're listening to part one of a two-part series on the possible murder of Nirvana frontman Kurt Cobain. The letter found at the scene by police was immediately labeled a suicide note. The police report states it was apparently written by Cobain to his wife and daughter, explaining why he had killed himself. But was it in fact a suicide note? Even that is now being called into question by investigators and amateur sleuths alike. Max Wallace. But if you look at the suicide note upon further close examination, you see that there's uh, two different sets of handwriting, what appears to be two different sets of handwriting. And the first part of the note doesn't seem like a suicide note at all. It seems like a letter from her to his fans explaining why he's quitting Nirvana. That note that was written didn't necessarily say that it was written to Courtney and his daughter. It was mostly for Nirvana fans telling them why he wanted to quit the music business altogether. And in fact, that wasn't such a bizarre theory because he, there's been talk that Kurt Cobain wanted to split up Nirvana. He wanted to get out of music and recording. He wanted to stop touring because he didn't like the way that some of the fans were treating not only other fans, but the style and the makeup of his fans going from, you know, a more punk oriented attitude fan base to all of a sudden selling 25 million copies of never mind and you have you know jocks who he hated the preppy popular people who he hated being in his audience so he just wanted to shed all of that the only short footnote to courtney and francis and the handwriting was contained in the last couple of lines of the letter and those were even questioned by several handwriting experts I'm the only person that's really done a detailed analysis that's been published, uh, you know, basically in full. Uh, Unsolved Mysteries had a um, an Oxford uh, University guy named uh, Reg Alton look at it, but they never released his report, so we don't really know what reasoning went into uh, this Oxford professor's analysis of it. He raised that. He said that the bottom lines were different from the top lines. Everybody knows that. The most important thing to know about the suicide note, so-called, uh, is that there are no connecting movements between the letters uh, and this is extremely contrary to the way that anyone can see that Kurt Cobain used a ballpoint pen uh, for instance in the manuscript uh, to uh, Smells Like Teen Spirit his greatest hit uh, the rate of cursive movement is roughly 50% 50% of the words in the lyrics of Smells Like Teen Spirit are cursive fairly elegant cursive, that's the way Cobain wrote. That's not the way that the forger wrote. The forger did not use connecting movements. In fact, the the, uh, the so-called suicide note is, I believe, 576 words long, and there's really only one plausible example of a three-letter movement. So, statistically, you know, it's a little hard to run the numbers here, but Compare 50% to a fraction, a tiny fraction of 1%. So, real Kurt Cobain writing, 50% cursive movement. Fake Kurt Cobain writing in the suicide note, less than 1%. Tom was hired by Courtney Love, who was in Los Angeles at the time, to locate Kurt Cobain after he left that drug rehab center in California. And in fact, he was in Kurt Cobain's house the night before Kurt's body was discovered right above the garage. And he's always stated that although the police concluded a suicide, he, he can't really prove anything per se because it's just a theory, but he's always always had the feeling that there was something really wrong. Tom Grant has a handwriting practice sheet, the kind of practice sheet that kids use in school to practice their handwriting, to perfect their cursive writing. It's very suspicious when you look at this practice sheet. It seems as if Courtney was practicing how to write in the style of Kurt. And then when you look at the so-called suicide note and the two different styles of handwriting on the note, you start to wonder, was she using this to practice forging a suicide note? And this is something that her own 
Tom Lawyer speculated to Tom Grant. One of the most important elements to the murder theory is the fact that Courtney's own lawyer, the godmother of her daughter, the entertainment lawyer, Rosemary Carroll, was talking quite candidly with Tom Grant. Tom Grant was hired by Courtney, so he was on Courtney's payroll to find her, and as such, her lawyer had no hesitation in confiding to uh, Tom. They were both on Courtney's payroll, and what she didn't know was that Tom was taping all these conversations. So we have tapes of Courtney's own entertainment lawyer speculating that the suicide note was forged, and absolutely uh, rejecting the idea that this was a suicide. She knew Kurt pretty well. So time and again, you have Rosemary Carroll turning against her own client. She was very fond of Kurt. She was his lawyer as well. And it's very clear that Rosemary thought that there was uh, foul play involved. I've been at odds with Tom Grant since you know 1994 when he first called me up and identified himself as Courtney Love's private investigator. And I thought, well, what the hell do you want, right? But uh, Tom Grant has come up with some absolutely stunning material over the years that he's finally released. The audio recording of Rosemary Carroll saying that she thinks it's a forgery. And also, rather stunningly, which has been seen in Soaked in Bleach, the, the relatively recent documentary, Rosemary Carroll said that Courtney Love left behind a backpack, which included a practice page or pages in which she was practicing someone's hand writing, which looks astonishingly uh, similar, especially to the, the bottom uh, lines uh, in the notes. So, you know, you combine the practice page and the attorney feeling that somehow the whole thing was a forgery, and what you get is Courtney Love is almost certainly the forger. The voice of a generation just 27 is found dead of an apparent self-inflicted gunshot wound. Another deeply depressed rock star, hopelessly addicted to heroin, and tired of living life in a fishbowl. That's the official narrative. But is that narrative a carefully spun mythology? Is it beginning to unwind? Was the shotgun too long? The levels of heroin in his body too high? Was the supposed suicide note a forgery? There is much more to this story. Many more questions to be answered. And next week on the Rock and Roll Twilight Zone, we'll dig deeper. Well, when you have someone like Courtney Love involved, uh, it's basically the lamb laying down with the lion and, and the lamb becoming the lion's breakfast. Kurt Cobain once famously said, just because you're paranoid doesn't mean they aren't after you. And perhaps more tellingly, he once let slip, a friend is nothing but a known enemy. Until next time, I'm Richard Serrett. So long for now. In their infinite wisdom, the pod guards have